All right, well, if you have a Bible this morning, I hope you brought one. I am going to be reading in 2 Kings chapter 4 today. I'm actually going to deviate from what I've been teaching on. I've been sharing a series of messages on why I believe the Bible. I've got a couple more of those queued up. But uh, today, I want to deal with something a little different. I want to encourage our faith today. Our faith in the Word of God. Our faith in the God of the Word. I've got a message I titled, A Great Woman. Amen. Great Woman. You know, there are some of those out there. And, and you know, we can learn things from a great woman. Amen. Just like we can learn things from a great man. We can learn faith. We can learn resilience. We can learn fortitude. We can, we can just learn so many things. And today, we're going to learn from an unnamed woman. Her name is never given. We don't know who she is. We only know where she lived, and we know what her actions were. But as a result of that, one day you'll meet her. Amen. One day you will. Second Kings chapter 4. And it... I'm in verse 8. And it fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem, where was a great woman. What did I say we were going to talk about today? A great woman. So he's passing through the town of Shunem, which was geographically a part of the tribe of Issachar. And uh, Elisha was on a circuit. He did basically the same thing that Elijah had done before him. He, he walked the circuit, preached in Samaria, the capital city of the northern kingdom, and would make his way back to Mount Carmel where they made their home and sort of their headquarters. He followed the same pattern that Elijah had done. And this is what he was doing here. He was passing to Shunem where was a great woman, and she constrained him to eat bread. Now that doesn't mean she grabbed him around the throat and shoved bread down his mouth, but that she was very persuasive uh, to stop to eat, and she fed him. And so it was that as often as he passed by, he turned in there to eat bread. And she said unto her husband, Behold, now I perceive that this is a holy man of God, which passeth by us continually, let us make a little chamber, a little room, I pray thee, on the wall, and let us set for him there a bed and a table and a lamp and a stool and the lampstand, and it shall be that when he comes to us that he will turn in there. And it fell on a day that he came there and he turned into the chamber and lay there. And he said to Gehazi, his servant, call this Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him, and he said unto her, and he said unto him, Say now unto her, Behold, thou hast been careful for us with all this care. What is to be done for thee? Wouldest thou be spoken for to the king or to the captain of the host? And she answered, I dwell among my own people. And he said, What then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, Verily, she hath no child, and her husband is old. And he said, Call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the door, and he said, About this season, according to the time of life, thou shalt embrace a son. And she said, Nay, my lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thine handmaid. And the woman conceived. And bear a son at that season that Elisha had said unto her, according to the time of life. And when the child was grown, it fell on a day that he went out to his father to the reapers. And he said unto his father, My head, my head. And he said to a lad, Carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door upon him and went out. And she called unto her husband and said, Send me, I pray thee, one of the young men and one of the asses, that I may run to the man of God and come again. And he said, Wherefore wilt thou go to him today? It's neither the new moon or the Sabbath. And she said, It shall be well. 
Then she saddled an ass and said to her servant, Drive and go forward. Slack not thy riding for me except I bid thee. So she went out and came into the man of God to Mount Carmel. And it came to pass when the man of God saw her afar off that he said to Gehazi, his servant, Behold, yonder is that Shunammite. Run now, I pray thee, to meet her and say unto her, Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, It is well. And when she came to the man of God to the hill, to the hill she caught him by the feet, but Gehazi came near to thrust her away. And the man of God said, Let her alone, for her soul is vexed within her. And the Lord has hid it from me and has not told me. Then she said, Did I desire a son of my Lord? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? Then he said to Gehazi, Gird up thy loins, take my staff in thy hand, go thy way. If you meet any man, salute him not. If any salute thee, answer him not again. And lay my staff on the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, As the Lord liveth, and as my soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And he arose and followed her. And Gehazi passed on before them and laid the staff upon the face of the child, but there was neither voice nor hearing. Wherefore he went again to meet him and told him, saying, The child is not awaked. And when Elisha was come into the house, behold, the child was dead and laid upon his bed. He went in, therefore, and shut the door upon them, and he prayed unto the Lord. And he went up and lay upon the child and put his mouth upon his mouth and his eyes upon his eyes and his hands upon his hands. And he stretched himself upon the child and the flesh of the child waxed warm. Then he returned and walked in the house to and fro and went up and stretched himself upon him and the child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes and he called Gehazi and said call the Shunammite so he called her and when she was come in unto him he said take up thy son and she went in and fell at his feet and bowed herself to the ground and took up her son and went out Now, the Bible calls this woman great. The Bible doesn't call too many people great. But it does call her great. Now, this is a woman who received two miracles from the Lord. Two miracles. A miracle of birth. And then a miracle of resurrection. Generally, when the Bible speaks especially in Old Testament times of somebody being called great, the Hebrew word there uh, can mean several things. Uh, it can be translated older, that she was an older woman. It can be translated elder, that she was elderly. It can be translated mighty, uh, as in powerful or strong. So it might not have meant that. It can be, it can mean to be noble. It can mean to be wealthy. Uh, it can mean to have a, a position. I think one version translates it that she was a woman of high position. <laughs> Excuse me. Basically, what it amounts to and what it, what it boils down to is this. This woman and her husband were people of some prominence in their community. Now, they didn't live in a big city. They lived in Shunem. Uh, and it was far from, from the capital. But in their community, they were a people a family of some standing, which means they had some local prominence. They probably were somewhat affluent, uh, probably owned some land. Sometimes when it speaks of someone being great, it also refers to the fact that they might have had a, a good bit of land. Maybe they had a lot of cattle or whatever. So here's a family with some position, some standing, some prominence in the community, some nobility, and uh, but they lacked one thing. They had no child. And in ancient times, this was not only a shame, in many ways it was almost a disgrace to not be able to have a child, a, an heir to carry on the family name. Uh, you know, they thought uh, much of those things. But the Bible, while it never names this woman, it does tell us, does, does tell us numerous things about her character qualities of her life that really make her stand out and really make her great 
in more ways than just the fact that she might have had a little money or a little affluence. Makes her great in many more ways. And one of the ways I'd like to point out to you is that this woman was great in her instinct. She was great in her uh, perception. This is a woman who was able to see a need that somebody else had. Now, let me bring your attention back to verse 8, where this great woman constrained Elisha the prophet to eat bread. Now, we told in verse 9 that she saw Elisha pass by continually, and we're also told, verse 9, that she perceived, she recognized that Elisha was indeed a man of God. That made him unlike many of the priests to the Baals. It made him unlike uh, many of the uh, pseudo-priests uh, that were more interested in money than anything else. She perceived this is a real man of God. And he passes this way regularly. I mean, this is a regular thing for him to come by. And she recognized that when he came, he could sure use a meal. And so she constrained him to eat. Now, now I'll tell you, this means the woman had some ability to persuade. Persuade to such a degree that you notice that as often as Elisha passed by, verse 8, the, the bottom part of verse 8, as often as he passed by that area, he stopped in to eat. As often as he passed by, this woman made him feel welcome and right at home so that he could stay, he could eat before he resumed his travels. Now, Here's the part I would really like to point out. Here is a woman, a woman of some prestige, some prominence, some affluence, uh, who was not self-absorbed. You know, here in America, I want to tell you, it's very easy to become so wrapped up in your own little world, your own little world win many times, uh, of all your worries and troubles and needs and problems and family and so on, that you fail to see obvious things right in front of your eyes. The needs of others, uh, situations other people may be going through, because we tend to be a selfish, self-centered self-absorbed people. Amen. I don't want to offend anybody, but that's just the way it is. We think about ourselves. We think about ourselves. Our own world. Here's a woman who was able to see outside of herself. Outside of her circle. You know, a, a lot of people, if they have a little money, let me tell you what they think about. Oh, I broke a nail. I've got to go take care of this right away. Uh, who are we having over for the dinner party next week? I hope I have proper earrings or maybe I need some more diamonds or that, that, certainly that's not the way everybody with affluence is. I hope not. But the tendency is to be wrapped up in insignificant, unimportant trivialities that, uh, that wells around your own self. This woman recognized the man of God when she saw it. I, I wish we could do that. You know, I mean, as a people, as a nation, that we could recognize real men of God and know which ones aren't, <laughs> but recognize the real men of God. And here's something else that I said she was a woman of perception, a woman of great perception. She not only saw a need... But what else did she do? She was a woman of action. A woman of action. You know, when I, I remember one of the times when I read this, I said, we need woman, women like that. Of course, we need men like that, too. Amen. When they see a need, they don't say, you know what we need? I mean, even here in the church. Let's just think about right here in the church. You ever think, you know, there's some needs here. 
We need some more workers. We need some more volunteers. We need some people to help in children's church. Or we need some people to help in uh, in the nursery. Or we could sure use a youth ministry. I, you know what I think we should have? We should have uh, something for, maybe for the singles. Maybe we should have a young, uh, uh, maybe a Bible study for young married people. Or, or maybe we should, it's easy to see the needs. But what, what we need is people of action. Say, so I see the need, now what can I do? What can I do? That's what, that's what made this woman great. What can I do to help? How can I help? She didn't say, let me see what somebody else can do to help. Somebody else needs to volunteer. Somebody else needs to step forward. Because I'm busy. I mean, i got broken nails here. I need to take care of it. And I'm busy. My schedule is so busy. I flitting here and there. No, here's a woman who saw the need and said, what can I do? What can I do? So she was not only a woman of perception, she was a woman of action. And she was a woman who knew how to use her influence. Because she went Verse 9, to her husband. <laughs> Nobody can influence a husband like a wife. <laughs> and vice versa. Who's going to influence you more than your spouse? Uh, I mean, as far as a person goes. There are people who influence us, but nobody has a greater influence as a person, generally, than the person you're married to. She goes to her husband, she says, here's what we need to do. <laughs> so she volunteered him. Kind of like Connie volunteered Vic to be our worship leader. Amen. Vic didn't even know. He got volunteered. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and he's been here ever since. How about that? Praise God. But look, so here's a woman great in perception, great in awareness of what's going on around her. Are you aware? Most women are pretty perceptive. I, I have to acknowledge that. My wife is perceptive about things I'm oblivious to. Then there are other things that I feel like I'm more perceptive. Like I bet they got fish over there. You know. That's <laughs> no, just that's just this. <laughs> but women women do have great instincts uh, just about a lot of things, but. Here's, a, here's another area where this woman was great. She was great in grace. Great in graciousness. Great in hospitality. Great in not only seeing the need, but willing to be put out and to spend money to meet the need. In fact... Like I said, she made Elisha so comfortable that he felt like he could turn in and eat any time he was passing through. I mean, that's how welcome she made him feel. Look, any time you're in our neighborhood, you knock on this door, you've got a meal here for you. Any time. He never was made to feel like he was imposing. Now, you know, it takes grace to, to do that, to make people feel that welcome and that at home. And then, as if that wasn't enough, look what she t tells her husband. Look, this man... Needs a place to stay, not just a not just a hot meal. He needs a place to stay. So we're going to let's build a little room onto the house. Nothing fancy, but let's build. It didn't have to be thirty-five thousand square feet or anything. Just a little room on the side of the house where he'll have a stool and a table and a bed and a lamp. Now you know if Elisha had been a real proper prosperity prophet he could have had his own mansion over there I mean he could have had one all around the countryside but he didn't buy the right tapes it's the right you know uh, DVD sets or whatever and how to prosper or whatever you know. I'm just, uh, uh, you know sometimes I just can't help myself I have <laughs> but she recognized the fact that he was a man of God in spite of the fact that he looked hungry. In spite of the fact that when he passed by, he didn't have a place to stay. 
Now, if he'd have been a real man of God, he'd have had a few diamonds on his fingers and a cloak that cost a lot of money and some designer clothes and... I guess you're right. No, even then, even then, the false prophets tended to prosper. <laughs> well, here's what she did. They added a room onto the house so that when he was passing through, he could stay right there in that little room. It was always there for him, a prophet's chamber or a prophet's room. Now, that makes this woman great in generosity. Great in generosity, willing to give of their substance to bless, uh, to further the cause of God. Hello. You know, you don't have to be rich to be generous. Because it's easy to think, well, they had money, they can be generous. But you don't have to be rich to be generous. What about the widow's might? You know, she, she didn't have much of nothing, but was very generous. The Lord said, the Lord himself said she gave more than all the rest of them. That's how generous she was. Or what about uh, the little widow of Zarephath who had nothing but a little bit of meal and a little bit of oil, but she was able to be generous with that. My point here is that to be generous, all we really have to do is, is to be thankful for what the Lord has given us. Uh, and and we should be a thankful people. We're approaching Thanksgiving week where our nation uh, tries to remind us all that uh, we should be a thankful people. And uh, thanksgiving and gratitude should be a part of our everyday life. We may not, not, not have everything that other people have, but let's praise God for what we do have. And Also, I would like for us to see something else. Not only was she great in generosity, uh, and she had a great influence on her husband by his willingness to, to do what she said. We don't know nothing about her husband except that obviously they owned some lands because he was out in the field in the lands, but he was influenced by his godly wife. I'll tell you this, a godly wife has a tremendous influence on her family. Uh, her prayers have a tremendous influence on uh, her whole family. Her actions have a tremendous influence. Never, ever underestimate the influence of a godly woman, a godly wife, uh, a, a praying wife, a, a woman who lives a consistent example. Uh, things occurred because of this woman's godly example. Uh, miracles occurred, actually, because of this woman's godly example. Uh, so... She gave, she was uh, great in generosity, and you know what, as a result, you know the old expression, you can't outgive God. I realize that sometimes it's become a cliche, and sometimes uh, people use it to extract money and to manipulate, but it remains true that when you give out of a willing heart, generously, ge just genuinely and generously, you know the Lord's, he, He's just going to bless you in ways that maybe you didn't even imagine. Now you don't give to get. You don't give looking for a return. You give out of a grateful, thankful heart, expecting nothing in return. But, but I'll tell you the Lord, He does bless. And here in verse 11, Elisha is laying in that, in that chamber, probably stretched out on the bed, thinking how nice this is, rather than having to sleep in his cloak on the side of the road. Uh, and he says, you know what? Call that Shunammite woman. Just call her over here. And let's see how we can bless her. He says, verse 12, they called her. And he says to her in verse 13, say now... You've been careful for us with all this care. That is, you have really been a blessing to us. You've looked after us. You've recognized our need, our situation. You've been such a blessing. Notice what he says. What is to be done for you? What would you like for me to do for you? What would you like in return? Would you like for me to speak to the king? Now, Elisha, he may have been a, a prophet who uh, wandered, seemed like, Penilessly, but Elisha was a man of some powerful 
uh, influence and he could get an audience with the king. Would you like for me to speak to the king for you? Is there something you need from the king? Would you like, maybe just like to appear in the court? Would you like, uh, you know, some place, some position, some title, some honorary position? What do you want? He says, how about to the captain of the host? Is there something you, you need, something you'd like to have, some influence? Your husband's a landowner. They can always use influence with the officials or whatever. What can I do? What would you like to have? It's almost like a carte blanche. What do you want? Here's her answer. I dwell among my own people. This tells us this is a woman of great humility. A woman who is content. A content woman. I dwell among my own people. You know what she was saying? I don't want anything. What would make you think I want anything? I don't want anything. I don't want to appear before the king. I'm not looking for honors or titles. I live here, you know, we may be in some remote rural area, but we, we don't need anything. I don't lack anything, and there's nothing over there in the city that, you know, attracts me. Prestige, power, titles, prominence. I don't need a thing. Content. Content. First Timothy Chapter 6 says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. I, I remember uh, I heard a, about a fella, it was just a little bit later in the year, pretty close to when everybody was doing all their madhouse Christmas shopping. And this fella was in a long line waiting to buy something at the counter. And the woman ahead of him had a whole bunch of things, and, and, and he was, she was, they were adding it all up. And when it came time to pray, pay, uh, the lady, the cashier says, we're going to put that on your credit card? She says, oh, no. She says, I never charge anything. She says, I pay cash for everything. If I can't pay cash, I don't buy it. And the man behind her, he said, will you marry me? <laughs> <laughs> How often do you find somebody who is great in contentment? Now, you might think, I know what the temptation is to think, yeah, well, she was wealthy. It's easy to be content when you're wealthy. <laughs> but do you know that the bug, the virus of discontent strikes the rich just as powerfully as it does the poor? In fact, it almost seems like the more you seem to get, the more unhappy you are. I think it's partially because here in America with this materialistic uh, philosophy of life, we tend to think that things or money or material possessions will make us happy. And when we get a few things, we find out we're no happier than we were before. So maybe it's just that I need a little more or a little bigger or, or a little newer. So... So we stretch to get a little more, a little bigger, a little newer, and we find out that didn't make us happy either. In fact, if anything, it adds to our worries and woes. So maybe if we just had a little bit more, a little more, a little more. One of the richest men in the world was once asked, what is it going to take for you to finally be content? Now this man was a billionaire. What's it going to take for you to finally be content? Here was his answer, a little more little more. See, the discontent bug uh, tries to bite us all. But the Bible tells us, 1 Timothy 6, godliness with contentment is great gain. In fact, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to read a couple of those verses, if you don't mind. I'm going to come right back to uh, 2, uh, 2 Kings 2. But listen to this. I want to read a couple of verses. 1 Timothy 6, 6. But godliness... With contentment is great gain. You know what contentment basically means? It means to be satisfied. Amen. You're satisfied. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Not taking it with you. 
And having food and raiment, the, the Greek word here basically means shelter, covering. Having food and raiment, let us be there with content. The idea here is that the Christian, for the Christian, we are not supposed to have insatiable appetites for worldly things and for worldly possessions. That, that's not supposed to characterize us. It doesn't. It doesn't mean that there's something wrong with having things. Let's not make that mistake. But to be content where you are uh, with what you have is a gift that only comes, uh, I believe, by faith in Christ. Amen. That you can actually be content. Uh, what if, what if you never get that house that you think, you know, I, I might go through my whole life and never really own my own house. Never own my own house. I might be an apartment renter all, all of my life. So what? Amen. You're not taking the house with you. You're right. You're right. You can't take it with you. Amen. What if you go through your whole life and you never really own that big three carat diamond that you, <laughs> you know, you just, what if you, so what? You can't take it with you. Right. Amen. He says, but they that will be rich, and the idea of those that will be rich, uh, it doesn't mean that they, those who become rich inevitably, or it, it means those whose desire, whose longing is to be rich. Those who long to be rich, those who are determined to be rich, the Bible says, fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith. You mean if you long for money, if money is your goal, riches, wealth, money, prestige, power, if that is your goal, you could actually err from the faith. And the Greek word there means to be seduced. That's correct. The goal to own, to possess, to acquire is a false goal. Amen. It's not the Christian's quest. Nothing wrong with owning, acquiring, or possessing. I hope everyone's understanding what I'm saying. But that is not our goal in life. Amen. Our goal, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things, he'll, he'll just add them to us. Our love, our affection is not set on things below, but on things above. We don't set our affection, our hearts, uh, on things perishing, but on things eternal. Amen. He says, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Then he goes on and says, but you, O man of God, flee from those things and follow after righteousness and godliness and faith and love and patience and meekness. Well, here's a woman who was great. And then, back in Second Kings chapter 4, she didn't want anything. There's nothing that Elisha could give her that she wanted. So, the Lord gave her what she didn't ask for. He gave her a son. And then tragically, some years later, when the boy was still young, but old enough to go out in the field to meet his dad, tragedy struck. And out there in the field one day with his dad, he says, my head, my head. The dad thought maybe it's a headache, maybe the sun's too hot. He told one of the servants, take, take my son back to his mother. Let him go inside and rest, get out of the sun for a while. And so they brought him inside. And he, the mother laid the boy on her lap for a few hours, and then he died. He didn't pass out. He didn't swoon. He didn't faint. The Bible very specifically says he died. Now, of all the tragedies you can imagine, <clears throat> this is an older couple. They thought it was never going to happen that they would have a child, and then God blessed them with a the child. And then in all of their joy, and you know how much attention they must have paid to that child, and 
what a treasure he was and in the in his early young life to be snatched away uh, was just a devastating blow a, a blow beyond what a person you would think should should endure but here's the fact of life none of us are exempt from tragedy or trial or adversity everybody goes through trial tragedy it doesn't matter if you walk with God and you serve God and you give of yourself all the things this woman did still she experienced great tragedy Job's another perfect example of that in fact Job says in Job 14 verses 1 and 2 man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble that's Job's uh, confession. He says he comes forth like a flower and is cut down. Yeah. He flees also like a shadow and continues not. That's Job's declaration about the human condition. Man that's born of woman is a few days and full of sorrow. Amen. Well, we've all been through it, haven't we? But let's notice one more thing about this woman. She had great faith. This was a woman of great faith. In verse 20 and 21, she actually sent for a servant. She says, go tell my husband I'm going see the man of God. Now, to go to Mount Carmel, where Elisha was, was about a six-hour run, six-hour trip. So he says, well, what are you going there for? It's not the new moon. It's not the Sabbath. <laughs> And uh, while synagogues didn't exist back in these days, they didn't come until the intertestament period, but you can see that it was already the custom for believers to gather together uh, during those special times. So that's what they did. They would gather. The man of God would undoubtedly teach, uh, pray, and so on. So he wants to know, well, wait, it's not the new moon. It's not the Sabbath. Uh, you're going to go see the man of God? And her answer is, Shalom. It will be well. That's the Hebrew, shalom. It'll be well. It's going to be all right. She didn't say, our son is dead. She didn't tell him. She didn't wail. She didn't scream. She didn't fall into hysteria. She didn't announce to any of the servants that our son has died. She went into the prophet's womb, the chamber that they had set aside just for him, and she laid the child on that bed. And she said, I'm going to see the man of God. So, here's a part of great faith. You know where to turn in trouble. Amen. You can turn to the east and the west. In fact, you can turn in every direction so, so fast that your head spins around on, a, on your neck. But until you turn to the Lord, Amen. you're turning in the wrong direction. She turned to the Lord, the true source of help, the true source of comfort, and the true source of miracles. She turned to the Lord. Now, sometimes we don't turn to the Lord until tragedy strikes. Sometimes we're too oblivious. Sometimes we just go on our own merry way and we think, you know, everything's going to continue as it is. But life can change in a moment. In a moment, everything can change. And what starts out as a normal day, my son's going to go out in the field, he's going to go see his dad, uh, or my husband's going to go off to work like he does every day. It's just ordinary, it's just routine, he's going to go off to work. Yep. Or, you know, my wife is just going to be shopping a little bit today, going to the grocery. Nobody knows what a day can bring. Amen. Nobody knows. Amen. Things can change in a moment. But when things do change, do you know where to turn? Do you know where to look? Do you know who to call upon? This woman had great faith. She got on that donkey and she told the servants, Drive! I like that. <laughs> the idea is don't you stop for anything. You know, riding on a bumpy road and a, a, a narrow trail and a, a donkey, probably not as comfortable as your Chevrolet. Uh, so you can imagine what uh, you might bounce around like that. But she said, don't you pay no attention. You ride. We're, we're going to go see the man of God. Now, here's what I like right here. Oh, 
Elisha recognized that it's the Shunammite. He says, verse 25, Yonder is that Shunammite. Run now, I pray thee, to meet her and say unto her. Now, now keep this in mind. He, he wants to know, is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with your child? Keep in mind, years have passed. And Elisha is staying at her house in that little prophet chamber every time he goes through town. He knows this family. He knows this child. He has probably had that child on his lap. In fact, it was his prayer that gave her that child. He knows this man. He knows the family. He knows them all well. So he asks about the family. Is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with your child? And listen to her answer. Is it well? What do you think? She didn't tell him all the problems, all the circumstances, all the adversity. She didn't tell him. Here's what she said. It is well. The, the Hebrew word here, shalom, peace. It is well. Is it well? Here's her faith. Her faith said, it is well. It is well. How could she say that? How can she say it is well when her son is laying dead six hours away? How can she say it is well when the love of her life, her very heart has been crushed and broken? How can she say it is well? Well, I'll tell you how she said it. This was a great woman of great faith. So that no matter what the adversity, no matter what the trial, the trouble, the affliction, the distress, her faith and her confidence was unwavering. She said, it is well. It is well. I want to read to you just a little bit. I can't read it all, but it's the words to a hymn. It's a hymn that was written by a fellow named Horatio Spafford. He died back in the 19th century. But here's a man who had two great tragedies in his life. First, he was a very affluent, wealthy businessman in Chicago until the great Chicago fire. And in the Chicago fire, he lost his business, he lost everything he owned, and became impoverished. And after struggling again to, uh, to work, to earn a living, he sent his daughters to Europe. And they were supposed to, his wife and his daughters, they were supposed to wire back as soon as they got there. Unfortunately, on the way, the ship collided with another ship and sank. And all four of his daughters died. He got a telegram from his wife. And his, wife, his wife's telegram just said two words, safe, alone. All the children were dead. He took this same ship or a similar ship and made the same journey. And crossing over the area where his daughters had died, he said the Spirit of God moved on him so powerfully that he actually began to write, the words to what is now known as a great hymn called, It Is Well With My Soul. I'm going to read some of the words. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trial should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh, my soul. He goes on to say, I'm going to read the last stanza, And Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight, 
and the clouds be rolled back as a scroll, the trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend, even so it is well with my soul. And of course the refrain is, it is well, it is well with my soul. Listen, I think about this often. In fact, the words of this great woman often come from my lips. Uh, when, when the servant asked, is it well, is it well? You, you almost are afraid today to ask people, how's it going? Because every single one of us could give a litany. I mean, we could write out a catalog of our problems, distresses, grievances, needs, and so on. Uh, well, let me just tell you about my last operation. We could, we could spend hours, you know, talking about... All, but here is a woman in the midst of her grief who said, it is well. Is it well with you? Is it well with your children? Is it well with your husband? It is well. She didn't say, oh well. But she said, it is well. How about us? You see, this is a confession of real faith. Of real faith. And look, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's what the Bible says. What's in your heart comes out of your mouth. This woman was confident. She was so confident that she would say, it is well. Now here's my question to us. When friends betray you, when your financial need seems insurmountable, when the doctor says nothing more can be done, when your family looks like it's falling apart, unraveling at the seams, can you say it is well? I'd be lying if I said it as well. <laughs> it's a mess. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> and yet this woman, her faith was so great that she declared what her heart believed. Out of the abundance of her heart, her mouth spoke, and she said, it is well. Now let me tell you what, that, what faith is. Faith is the absolute assurance in your heart that God's got this. He's got it. It doesn't matter what I see. It doesn't matter what I'm going through. It doesn't matter what my circumstances. It doesn't matter what my personal loss, grief, tragedy. It is well. I know God has this. Amen. I know He's got it. And my response here is to trust Him. Yes. Yes. When the bank says we're foreclosing, you got 30 days to get out. Can you say it as well? What if they come and put you out on the street? It happens, you know. Right. It happens to Christians. It happens to good people and godly people. Can you say it is well? God's got this. I don't need that house anyway. This woman latched on to the prophet and wouldn't let go. And of course, the way this story ends is God raised that child from the dead. Restored that child to life and returned that child to his mother. My encouragement to you is that whatever a day brings, whatever confronts us around the next turn in the road of life, you can say it is well with the confidence of this nameless Shunammite woman, yet a great woman. You can say with full and absolute assurance it is well if and only if you have real faith and confidence in the God of the Bible. Yeah. And that means you can stand on his promise. You know, he has promises. Promises uh, that Peter calls exceeding great and precious. Promises that meet our every need. Promises to provide our every need. 
My God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. If you will seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, then all of these things will be added unto you. If we'll do our part, seek the Lord, serve the Lord, live for the Lord, He'll meet every need. Now, will we not go through trial? Oh no, we'll go through trial. Will, will faith be tested? Faith is always tested. Will there be adversity? Will there be pain? Will there be sorrow? Will, will there be times where it seems like heaven is not hearing your prayer? Quite possibly. But heaven always hears your prayer. There's a wonderful passage in Psalm 65 and verse 2 that I pray you'll never, ever forget. Where it speaks of thou God that heareth prayer. We serve a God that hears prayer. Amen. He hears your prayer. He hears my prayer. And so that you can say in the midst of your trouble, in the midst of your trial, yep. it is well. Amen. How you doing, brother? It is well. How are you, sister? It is well. Is it really well? It is well. How do you know it's well? Because I'm standing on the promises. I'm standing on the promises. I'm not being moved by my circumstances. I'm standing on the promises of God. Amen. And you know, one last thought. Miracles still happen. You know. <laughs> He's still a miracle God. He's still a miracle God. Here we see a miracle of life given and then life restored. He can still heal. He can still deliver. He can still provide and save and change the hearts of our loved ones. He may not raise our loved one from the dead. Then again, we could pray that he did, that he would. One day, though, he will raise all from the dead. All. There will be a resurrection of life and a resurrection of damnation. We want to make sure we're in the right resurrection. So let's leave today with the thought that whenever you consider your problems, whenever you consider the, the needs, the adversity, the trials that face you, let's consider His promises greater than our problems. Amen. That His Word, His Word is greater than our worries. His truth more powerful than our trials. So that we can say, it is well. Amen. It's not a lie. You're right. We're not deluding ourselves. It's not the power of positive confession. Amen. It's our faith's expression of confidence in the God we serve. Thank you, Lord. It is well. Well, Father, we pray today that you would... Help us to emulate the character and faith of this great woman. This Shunammite woman who received her dead, raised to life again. A woman of great grace, of great perception, of great generosity. A woman, Lord, of great discernment. A woman of great faith. Lord, help us to transform our words, our confession from whining and complaining and grumbling to true words of faith and confidence in you. Lord, we, we thank you for the time together we had today. We ask, Lord, that you would just bless and encourage everyone here to look to you. Look to you, the God who hears prayer, so that we can confidently say, no matter what our problem, your promises are greater, and it is well. Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Amen, amen. amen.
it is well.